and you know let you know with our questions uh, oh yeah that's great and, but yeah. then uh let's say good morning and good evening for our listeners in uh in the nordics or in sweden and welcome to the seminar on how to do business in the u.s uh, first of all thank you ignite and still now with your team for putting this together and today we have two very interesting guests that are uh, going to help us to share their experience and uh, knowledge on how to enter the U.S. market. And we have uh, Giro, you uh, do this, and you're, uh, you've been helping and promoting Nordic and Norwegian companies for a very long time. You've until recently been the chairwoman for Nordic Innovation House, and you currently hold the position as uh, regional director of uh, the Americas at uh, Innovation Norway. That's right. Pleasure to be with you. Thank you for inviting me. That's going to be great fun. Uh, and we have Sean Percival that uh, a few of you might already know. He's a uh, former uh, VP of marketing, um, online marketing at MySpace. He's been very heavily involved with 500 startups, um, uh, Catapult Accelerator, you're an investor, an author, uh, and much more. The list more. just goes on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Uh, so we're very happy to have you because among the two of you, you probably helped uh, over hundred or maybe even thousands of companies in different ways. Um, and my name is uh, Marcus Leo. I'm uh, right now a senior fellow at Nordic Innovation House in Palo Alto and the Swedish team. And I have a background of running something called Start Sweden and at Almi, which is uh, Sweden's most active seed investor and one of the largest uh, providers of business loans in Sweden. But uh, let's start then. Uh, Giru, I would like to ask you actually, is it possible to talk about the US market as like one big market or do we need to break it down into different states? Well, for sure, not possible to talk about the US as one, no. And uh, I would say not even state by state, maybe more industry by industry. And um, my team in uh, Americas, we deal with uh, we de deal across industries that are of interest to Norway. But uh, our team in Silicon Valley obviously focus on um, tech startups, uh, tech scale ups, and um, corporate innovation. And within that segment or those segments, I would say it is possible to talk about it as one. All right. What do you say, Sean? I mean, being uh, American. Yeah, most of my experience is California based. <clears throat> and um, yeah, us Americans, we're very competitive. So SF thinks they're the best. LA thinks they're better. New York is, you know, the whole world. So there, there's lots of, you know, we have the Norway and Sweden brother sister kind of competition that happens in many, many different markets. But we have seen where like people have carved out or regions have carved out what they're best at. Silicon Valley, it's tech, it's B2B. LA is media, e-commerce, you know, those really thrive there. New York, media, advertising, content, Tumblr, these kind of things as well. So every region is definitely dramatically different. They're creating their own kind of voice, but we have lots of smaller ecosystems that have also come up in the Midwest and, and different parts in Chicago and all these places. Detroit, when all the prices came down, a lot of sort of entrepreneurs ran in. So. Yeah, I mean, America, it's a unique place and it's very, very diverse on a city, state and uh, sort of nationwide as well. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a big continent. It's almost as big as Europe. And if you compare like north of Europe with south of Europe, yeah, that's a big difference. So yeah, why shouldn't it be here? Um, but you're, what, what would you say, like how, if I'm a startup or a company uh, that wants to bring uh, my company to the US, like, how could I identify which part, which state should I enter with my specific, within my specific industry? So what we typically see is that um, it's difficult to understand sitting on another continent and even difficult to understand when you sit in the USA because the, the industries are so different and the cultures between regions are so different. So what we recommend to everybody is to to validate no matter how big they are or how success, successful they are, how much scale they have on their product or service back in, in Europe and, or in the Nordics. But 
basically go out and ask potential partners, potential customers, potential investors, um, you know, what do you think about what we deliver? Is it interesting? Does it fill a need for you, et cetera? So basically validate with the market. And um, uh, at Nordic Innovation House, we consider uh, being connectors maybe the most important task that we have because we are not uh, the market. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we should not validate your product, but we can help you to make, uh, put you in contact with people who can help you to validate. So um, we, we see a lot of uh, Nordic companies being maybe a little bit too, let's say, humble or do not want to put themselves out there and make mistakes. Uh, but um, uh, it's important to let's say motivate them to to consider a no as a data point, not uh, a failure. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, we're going to circle back a little bit more to like networks and culture a little bit later. But first, Sean, I would like to ask you, like, you have a lot of experience of, of working with companies in different phases. When would you say, is it possible to say that a specific phase would benefit companies uh, better or worse than others? I mean, start up, ramp up, scale up, when would you actually try to enter the market, the US market? Yeah, I think if I was to quantify it, I would I would look at a business that had some revenue already in America. A, a kind of like rough benchmark that an American investor would look for is 20% of your revenue in America. That's what they really want to see as a starting point. Maybe that's happening organically and you just kind of push that as opposed to jumping in when you're like got nothing, you don't know anyone. You know, but in terms of stage, I think you can go early. I think to maybe add on a little bit of what Gro was talking about as well is that like the companies that fail, they send their entire team there. They burn so much money. Like if you think Norway and Sweden is expensive, like look at the rent in Silicon Valley. It's like actually twice as much. And, and you know, there's a lot more distractions going on. So I think the best thing to do is you set up one person there as a country manager great if he or she is American, because then they know and can help you. But you can do that at the very, very early stage and, and do it in steps. You know, don't make this huge, huge leap. I have seen a few, especially Norwegian companies that have done that. They burn all their cash and then they come back and they got the tail between the legs because they just feel so bad about it. You know, so yeah, don't be too American about it. <laughs> you know, have, have a little bit more measured in, in the approach you take. Yeah, I mean, uh, the rent, I can uh, I can agree with that. I, yeah, you uh, feel the pain now. <laughs> yeah, I just moved. Uh, yeah, it's double up from <laughs> the pricing back home in Sweden. Um, okay, but Drew, um, I've been at Nordic Innovation House now for one, one and a half month. Uh, we're talking about a lot about soft landing and how we can help companies with that. Um, could you maybe elaborate a little bit more? Like, what does it mean? Could we help them or... Does Nordic Innovation House help them to find partners or uh, uh, different types of contacts that they might need? Yeah, so, so we experience that we have a lot of the same questions from companies in, in similar stages. So for example, startups have a certain set of questions that they wonder about, uh, corporates a little bit different. And so what we try to do is to set up programs where companies can come together and, and go through a journey or an experience together, because then they can also share a lot uh, with each other and learn from each other, and they already have a network. And what we see is that these companies tend to help each other out uh, almost just as much as the program itself. Uh, so that's one example, a, a program that we call Tech Incubator that Sean has been heavily involved with uh, over the last, I think, six years. Um, and uh, we also do separate uh, advisory services for individual companies, but um, that depends more on, on what their specific need is. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, when we talk about soft landing, it's more to have a space to go to somewhere where your partners and customers and investors can find you, um, have a community to come to, and have somebody you can, you can ask about the, let's say, back office questions that you don't want to spend your time on. Yeah. Um, and we've been talking about uh, networking. We, we started talking about that 
that was such an important part of Silicon Valley or California experience uh, prior to COVID. Um, like from your the experience of both of you, uh, Sean and, and Guru, like, would you say that that's something American or is it very specific to Silicon Valley and California? Hey, I'm so sorry. My power went out. Talk about bad timing. So <laughs> I'm, I'm sitting in the dark on my phone and I, I think I missed some of that, if you wouldn't mind uh, repeating. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, we were talking about um, networking and uh, how important networking is in, in Silicon Valley and California. Uh, and I was wondering, is, is that a American thing or is it a California Silicon Valley thing that you need to network? Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely very different than the Nordics. I mean, I we often talk about this analogy of like, Norwegians or Swedes are like a coconut. You're really hard to get to know. It's this hard exterior. And the Americans are like a peach. They're very easy to get in and get to know, but then you hit that sort of pit and it's really hard to get to know them further. But I think you probably heard a lot about this and it, it sounds cliche, but it is true. This like pay it forward culture. And that's what's so special and unique about Silicon Valley is you have had so many successful people you almost feel this debt to it that you need to push forward and you need to you know, pay forward the, the goodness that you got, be it support or money or success or whatever it might be. So yeah, it's amazing how you could just reach out to anyone, different levels and say, I'd love to have coffee and chat. And a lot of them will accept that and, and get to know. But yeah, I would say that's one big difference between Americans and, and perhaps Europeans or the Nordics they use like relationships as a currency, <laughs> you know, it's like the more relationships you have, the more you can connect, but you can also talk about those relationships, which lead to more relationships. So it's very different. I, I've noticed in Norway, you don't brag about the people, you know, <laughs> maybe because mm -hmm. it's a small country, everyone knows each other, but like it is there, you, you brag and you want to make those connections to help others as well. So it's, it's very different. It is, like I said, it's like a currency, your relationships there to some expect, some, some regard. And would you say that like being a, a Nordic company and having that heritage, is that to your advantage or is it to your disadvantage? Because I heard about this uh, Danish company just when I arrived. It was a Danish company that they just uh, closed a uh, big round and uh, they had a lot of traction. And an experience that they shared was they actually changed their names when they were here to Andy and Will or something like that, just because it was easier for <laughs> for their American counterparts to uh, oh to know what to call them and then pronounce their Danish names. Do you need to like adapt more than that, or is it like that's okay name? That's all. I don't think so. Yeah, if your name was very hard to pronounce, maybe. <laughs> um, yeah, like some Americans I know do that coming here, so like you know to try and build trust. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think that the advantage is maybe that like, remember the Nordics are trendy. You can read about Scandinavia in most major publications in America every week. Maybe because things are so bad there, <laughs> we, we look and, you know, it's either the love of nature and, you know, last year it was, you know, Hige and, and getting Kushli and all these things. So like, I think it's an advantage and there's a high respect and they sort of know you're great at design and some other good attributes. So no, I, I wouldn't go as far. I, I would maybe embrace it. And, and it, it's a way you can connect and joke. And maybe they joke about you being a Viking and, and you can joke about them, you know, owning too many guns. I don't know. No, but like, <laughs> you, I, I, I like that. I think it's okay to be proud of the heritage and your culture and use that as a starting off point to, to see where you kind of match and what you know about each other. What do you think about that, you? I mean, you're yeah, being... yeah. I was eager to piggyback on that, actually. So, yeah, go ahead. so and having a <laughs> having a name as I do. <laughs> um, it's uh, I, I have an experience, obviously, of uh, nobody being able to pronounce my name in America. But um, uh, one of our other mentors, Nathan Gold, he uh, encouraged me to to use it as a benefit. And now I always start a new conversation with uh, my name is Gro, and that's exactly what I'm in the market to do. Help Nordic companies grow in this market. Love it. Uh, and, yeah. and, and I think it's a benefit because uh, people actually remember you. They don't remember where I come from, but they, they remember my name. And um, 
uh, also as uh, as uh, Sean says, I believe um, um, in in the Nordics. I feel like being a networker is something negative, uh, while uh, in Silicon Valley uh, we have learned that uh, when you pay it forward, uh, the innovation process speed up, and you get more validation, you get more insight, and it helps everybody in the end. And uh, one thing that Sean also talked about was um, um, was this shared mindset where people are curious uh, and they don't do this for the case of networking, but for the case of, uh, or curiosity to still their cur curiosity basically and to, to learn uh, and to develop faster. And I think uh, Reid Hoffman said it very well when he said Silicon Valley is a mindset, not a location. And obviously it is a location, but it's more importantly a mindset because there are so many people who are interested in the same things, uh, curi curious to kind of co-develop, et cetera. And it's amazing what that dynamic does to your company. And what we see working with hundreds of Nordic companies over the years is that when Nordic entrepreneurs and leaders see this and experience it, they become better networkers than any American because it works and it feels good to be of help and it feels good to be helped. So um, I think we have it in us. We just need to experience it. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, um, that's my experience as well. Um, but Sean, what would you say about um, and when Nordic companies try to enter or yeah, try to enter the US, I mean, marketing, uh, is that that's a whole other ball game here than back home? I mean, all the metrics, everything, they're more or less like created here. So what would you say? Like, what are the like the big difference in differences within marketing that you need to adapt coming as a Nordic company? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I, you know, I, I work with Norwegian companies mostly, but companies across all of sort of Scandinavia and even the Baltics. And what's most interesting to me when I'm coaching these companies here, I, when I'm telling them how to do marketing and the tools they use, I can see in their eyes that they don't get why they should do that. They don't want to bug people. Very, very, very Scandinavian. You know, whereas the American, if you're marketing there, we're so used to it. We have such a high bar for the amount of marketing we can take because we're so inundated by it, especially if you live in a, a major city, you just cannot escape it. So this is something I have to work with so much. And I have to really, really push Nordic founders, you know, that like, it's okay to email people. They will unsubscribe if they don't want it. And then, then they kind of get the logic too. But like, it's a completely different game. In America, that the thought is that like, if I don't grow fast, I will run out of money or someone will pass me by. But in Scandinavia, you don't have to, you don't have to look over your shoulder as much. You don't have as much competition or yeah. So it's like there, it's just, you're in this constant race and you become more aggressive. You know, you do things that things like seem weird or they don't scale. I think I'll do like one quick example. There the Silicon Valley company called Superhuman. And they just have a new email experience, very basic, you know, it's just email, but it's done better. What they do is when you sign up, the founder emails you, he calls you, he tries to get you started, every single person that signed up. And that was how aggressive it was. But the Americans were like, wow, this is so nice. He's calling me and helping me. <laughs> but like, I don't, I think it'd be hard to get a Scandinavian company to be like, call every new user and make them use your product. <laughs> so that those are maybe some comparisons, but yeah, you gotta like just turn the volume up on everything. And I always tell Nordic founders, cause I get that question of how much should I contact? And, and I'd say, you should just contact them two times more than you're comfortable with. That's probably the perfect amount. And, <laughs> and sometimes that helps, but like, yeah, you just have to be really aggressive. And especially in those critical times of the first 30 days of a user signing up or starting to use your product. You know, I think that's what Americans maybe do a little bit better. This like super strong activation, the pop-ups, the emails, the nudging, you know, that that's the American way. And, and you know, what would you say? Do you uh, agree with Sean on that? I mean, we have Nordic Innovation House must have had 
some experiences in uh, trying to reach out, like breaking through the noise uh, with different events, like Bifrost, example, uh, for example, or other types of uh, events. Like, how do you market like Nordic Innovation House? Well, I think we we try to take our our um, own medicine, so to say. Uh, I'm not gonna say that we're um, successful enough because there are so many things going on out there now, um, particularly in the in 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 the world where everybody is now online all the time, and uh, you have so many digital conferences you can go to every day, but. Um, uh, I think our actually most efficient um, marketing medium is uh, word of mouth. Mm -hmm. uh, we see that the most relevant customers, uh, the ones we can actually really help uh, be valuable for, are the ones who are recommended to us by others, other entrepreneurs, because uh, then they know what they get. Uh, but uh, if I am to share some of the patterns that we see from working with Nordic companies, I would say that I think Sean is a, a little bit uh, humble here. Uh, maybe uh -oh. un unusual, I, I, I unusual finally... <laughs> for an American. But, but yeah, Norway, you, black, you white, have Norway. Spent, you have spent too much time in the Nordics, Sean. Uh, but, but my point is that um, uh, in the Nordics, um, this is, this is changing, obviously, but we don't have to go that much back in time for the Nordics to not consider the difference between marketing and sales. And other also for sales to be not the most, uh, let's say, uh, respected, maybe, profession. Yep. While in, in, um, in the US, it's a very valued uh, profession it's a specialty. Uh, if you do marketing, you don't do sales. It's very specific. And uh, within marketing, Sean is one of the people who taught me that um, uh, how niche you need to be on metrics in order to find patterns and in order to understand that you're uh, moving in the right direction. And I think maybe we have a disadvantage in the Nordics in that we have much smaller markets. And uh, when you have smaller markets, you need to go broader in order to get enough customers to make it a big business. Meaning that there are some patterns that are not, uh, let's say, consistent across, for example, industries or type of companies, et cetera. While in the US, you can go for one very narrow niche of target customers, and it's easier to follow up on very niche metrics. Uh, but I do see that uh, Nordic companies who do identify the metrics that they need to, uh, to follow and, and agree on a few rather than very many, then it becomes kind of a game to just get better and better and better uh, results. And I think that's, uh, that's a good way to go for, for Nordic companies, at least in the early phase. Yeah. I mean, that's a great recommendation to break up, to, ver to make sure that you break up uh, between marketing and, and sales and that you have different professions. Uh, would, you, would you recommend Nordic companies when trying to start sales and uh, like get sales going in the US to actually hire then a, a local sales profession or try to bring their own team? Like what would be, have you seen any trends or any patterns in what has worked out? I would say in general, for sure, employ somebody local. <laughs> And uh, <clears throat> I, will, I will go back to, to that uh, comment. But, and the reason why I say it is that, uh, let's say the product has this quality. Then a typical American uh, um, salesperson would sell it up here. And the American buyer knows this. And so in comes a Nordic uh, salesperson. The, product is still here, the Nordic salesperson is typically a little humble, undersells it a little bit, and the American buyer knows that they, the normal salesperson, American salesperson would exaggerate, so they think the quality is down here. <laughs> so you have a big gap. So that, that's my easy way of explaining it. Uh, and it and ha doesn't have to, uh, it's not that, uh, that's, American salespeople lie, but they are 
just extremely good at positioning the uniqueness of what they offer. And uh, when you have a lot to choose from, you need to, you want to choose what is unique and what fills your need the most. But then I would also want to comment that when you employ a sales, uh, a local salesperson, we do see that it's extremely important to, um, to make sure that the person is kind of um, integrated in the, the culture of the company. And uh, that's why I entirely support Sean's recommendation to make sure that you have somebody who knows the company and uh, maybe start up a new region and for that person to involve and integrate uh, the sales team also in, in the mothership, so to say. And a company that we've seen do this extremely su successful is uh, Meltwater. It's founded by a Norwegian um, Norwegian um, entrepreneur, Jörn Lisegen, and um, he started his first um, company abroad in Sweden, uh, employed newly educated uh, Swedish country manager. And then from that Swedish team and the Norwegian team, they started up in other regions. And now it's actually one of the first employees that he employed in uh, Sweden who took over as the CEO of the international, the global company based out of San Francisco uh, earlier this year. So I think that's a, a great example of, of uh, how they've managed to build on the mothership culture. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, we, that's a great story. We should try to get a hold of him later on. Um, but then like when trying to enter the market and then uh, when you finally, uh, no, wait, I'm going to circle back to partnerships first. Uh, we've been talking about like sales, doing direct sales by yourself. Uh, but like partnerships, is that something that you would recommend uh, companies to start out with? I mean, we've seen like if I take, for instance, like a Swedish company that tried and maybe they didn't succeed at the first time is a company like Klarna. But now they have a different owner coming in, a partnership with Macy's. Uh, I mean, OK, this isn't a very big scale, but is that something that oh, should be uh, looked into by, by Nordic or Swedish companies when trying to enter the market? Do you, you want have to go first, Sean, or, or? Yeah, yeah Sean. I'm happy to. Yeah, and, and sorry, I still don't have video. I'm, I'm actually still sitting in the dark here in the power outage. So <laughs> it's part of the, I live outside of Oslo, so I'm, I'm in the countryside as it were. Uh -huh. um, yeah, on the partnerships, I don't. Maybe I'm. Maybe Gro and I will think differently on this. But I, I think I'm biased just because I'm so focused on online marketing and building your own growth channels, and I, I'm such a startup guy that I worry about startups trying to work with big companies too soon, because big companies have all the time in the world. They can sit in meetings all day. They can waste your time. It's not a problem. But as a startup, you have limited time and. And so I, I think I just have a bias that I want people to build their own acquisition channels. It could be one of many things in content, other types of marketing they do, paid ads, referral marketing, whatever it might be. So I, I think it's more important to establish those first. And then when you have raised significant capital, and that to me is like series A, it's raising millions of dollars. Now you can explore these partnerships and the corporates or the bigger partners will take you more serious. Because they, they have to really think about, hmm, should we put our time into this tiny company that might go out of business in six months? So you, you need to make sure that they're seeing confidence as well, that you're going to survive and, and the partnership will be you know, long-term meaningful for them. Mm -hmm. Yes, we, we, um, I don't think we see it so differently, but um, I would say that it's certainly a balance. And what works for one company does not necessarily work for others. And what uh, Sean describes um, as, uh, you know, the agility of a corporate can sometimes be a, a challenge for a startup or probably quite often. And we typically talk about it as a bear hug. You want a hug, but not from a bear because um, that you will probably possibly not survive, right? Uh, and uh, we do see cultural differences between Europe and the US in this respect as well, where 
especially Silicon Valley companies, they come in to disrupt uh, and typically do it themselves all the way through, while European companies typically come in as arms dealers to the larger companies. And then maybe over time, if they succeed, they disrupt that very same industry. Uh, so I would say in general, I would say that um, if you do want to use a partner, which can be useful because it gives you a potential network effect. You need less people in the market. Uh, you need to still, you need to understand the channel uh, because you do want to have the data points about your clients, your end clients. So I don't think I can give a, a clear answer on it. And I think different things work for, we've seen different things work for different companies. Yeah. Marcus, yeah. can I can I ask yeah. a question here, if that's mm -hmm. okay? Yeah, uh, I was uh, because you know um, Ignite Sweden is all mostly I would say ninety percent about B two B and and uh, B two B collaborations and a lot of the startups also in this room, for example, Daniel from uh, Stream Analyze uh, is a very successful, still quite early phase B two B AI startup, but wouldn't be able to prove uh, their business or, or business models or even find a business models without actually working together with large uh, companies uh, and quite kind of heavy deep tech within the industrial space. So, and, and in, in our perspective, um, having those crucial, important first validations with really large uh, corporates uh, is also a great way of finding and, and, you know, finding new partners, of course, but also the investments. These B2B startups, I would say, they, they are very, if they don't have that validation first, it's really, really tricky for them to, to get the, the bigger investments. So what's your take on that? Because they are, now we have several Swedish and the European startups that will meet with large B2B uh, American corporates, uh, in a couple of weeks. So what's your best advice there? Because they won't, you know, they won't be at that stage that Sean is uh, addressing. Yeah, no, I completely agree with you. I think that's the very best validation you can have. And the kind of the, the more, let's say, the more brand recognition the partner has, the more potential and the higher risk, obviously. Uh, but uh, I just, think it's important just to consider that your partnership is the most important thing happening for your startup it's not the most important thing happening for the big partner and and so to understand that they have different processes to respect that uh, and to work with it and to understand what like what hurdles do we need to overcome in order to make this a su successful partnership for both because i completely agree with you if it's a if it's a b2b you need that validation it's it's the way to the market yeah and i, I think i would tag in there that um yeah like i said i'm super biased i'm, I'm too much of a startup guy so I, I want these startups to destroy the corporates that's very american like i want them to take the corporates out of business and like an uber type style where it just you know completely replace the taxi industry that gets me excited that being said though yeah there, there's different types of partnerships and what i've seen that has worked really well for the nordic companies coming there is that when they can use these companies as distribution partners one example is like Shopify. This is you know, one of these large uh, e-commerce sites and they come to Silicon Valley, they drive placement in their app marketplace, they build a relationship with them so they get some promotion in the app marketplace. That, that I really like. I think that's super smart and it allows you to access all of their customers. Uh, so I think there's different ways to do it. And, and maybe this is what Ignite also does too, is you just, you gotta work with the right corporates. If they're talking to you, at least we know they're probably open for the idea of innovation and they probably have their own dedicated programs. They have their own corporate accelerators and they even have corporate venture as well. So it, I guess it's kind of more of like, you gotta really be careful and, and pick your battles. 
and you know maybe find out who is going to give you the results quickly and the results might be just like one person in the company is testing the technology and at least you've opened the door and now now the tough part comes get it to a hundred people in the organization get them to push you out as a distribution partner so yeah i, I don't want to 100 percent poo poo it but uh for some companies, it's just like, you gotta be really, really selective where you spend your time. Thank you, great insights. Over to you yeah. again, Marcus. Sorry for the interruption. <laughs> no, no, my, no, that know. was great. No, no problem. <laughs> I, like I like to be, I'm American. I like to be challenged. <laughs> uh, yeah, but moving on into the question um, or to this seminar, I wanted to address um, the phase when the companies have establish some type of presence in the US. And now you're more or less like in a growth phase. Uh, you're looking how to uh, recruit talent, capital. Uh, a little bit about that, like recruiting talents uh, in, the, in the US, and especially, I mean, here in Silicon Valley, there's a very high comp competition and you're trying to recruit talents when competing with like Google and Facebook. Like, how do you do that? Do you have some, any edge coming from the Nordics then? Or are you just an unknown company that, I mean, you have to work so hard just to, to establish your name among uh, all these others as a good employer? Do you, uh, do you want to weigh yeah, in on that? <laughs> it's, it's a good question and it's, it's really, really tough to answer. Um, yeah, I think that you do have to have more of a mindset of, it's actually called poaching. You know, it's a hunting term. And I mean, that's what I loved being in America. I got so many great opportunities because people tried to poach me. And I spent five years in Norway and only one company has tried to poach me <laughs> that whole time. And I took the job and it was great. It was whereby it was this big, you know, uh, video meeting company too. So yeah, you do have to be a little more aggressive. You have to do the American schmoozing, which is taking these people out to lunch. And it, it, it will be this process. But if I wanted to give you something really tactical, and I tell this to a lot of these companies here in Scandinavia, that a lot of times it is, I'm, I'm looking for a salesperson in London, I'm looking for a salesperson in the US, and how, what do I do? And I, the formula I say is you go to someone who has been a middle level salesperson, they, they've been there for two or three years, they're not moving up into sales director, or they're, they're not VP of sales yet, or they just can't climb that because the company is, is too big or it's too hard to move. And you go to these middle level people and say, hey, I need your expertise in my industry. I want to give you an opportunity to come in here and build our sales organization. And that's something also Americans will really love this, like this opportunity to like leapfrog and go from middle level or low level salesperson to the beginning of sales director and the beginning of VP of sales, the kind of where everyone really wants to get to. So I, I think that's part of the pitch is you'd be like, all right, do you want to sit on the phone all day for this company that you've been doing for three years? Or do you want to come here and help build the whole sales team and tell us how to do it? You know, throw that big opportunity at them and the right person will grab it. And, you know, you can try and they can grow in your organization and so it's kind of like get a big role in my company instead of your stuck in the middle role that you're at. It seems really direct, but I, I've seen it work before. Yeah, uh, uh, but it might be a universal thing with flattery and <laughs> leapfrogging, and that <laughs> that kind of it talks to me as well. <laughs> yeah, you, see, okay, it's already working. <laughs> uh, you, I mean, yeah. you must have some experience of uh, how, trying to recruit talents to Nordic Innovation House. I know that there's. Uh, local um, talents as well, recruiting not only people from the Scandinavian or Nordic countries. Yeah, that's true. And, and first of all, I would like to say that uh, I think you need to be careful about what you recruit for, uh, because um, we have excellent engineering competence in the Nordics. Uh, it's just as good and it's um, far less expensive. And it's more loyal and like less exposed to competition. So I would say in general, you recruit your, your tech team uh, back in the Nordics and you keep them there or somewhere else, not in Silicon Valley. 
uh, when it comes to sales and marketing, it's different. And I think it's extremely difficult to come through the noise, noise in those types of positions. Uh, what we do see work, though, is to kind of leverage the Nordic brand, because as uh, Sean said earlier, the Nordics have a great brand. Nordic tech has a great brand. It's considered trustworthy. It's considered, uh, uh, you know, delivering at time, delivering the quality we want. And also now with, with more focus on gender equality and sustainability, we have a really big advantage. So if you can find somebody who has some kind of link to the Nordics, somehow have studied, have been ex an exchange student, is married to somebody who's from the Nordics, um, you know, somehow identify somebody with a Nordic link and, and uh, fuel that passion, uh, that has been a really good um, um, experience for us. And... Uh, also to uh, to use the word of mouth when it comes to uh, fueling that or identifying that Nordic passion and then to to promote the let's say the benefits of being a Nordic company when you are in a discussion with a good candidate so an example is um, a, a Swedish company called Lukbeck who's a long-term customer of Nordic Innovation House and they have implemented a, um, a holiday and benefit um, policy that they call Nordic Plus. And it's because uh, in Silicon Valley, for example, people look to the big companies and say, oh my goodness, they have great benefits and holiday policies and you know, um, parental leave and all of that. And we're like, really? I mean, it's, uh, it's far less than what we have in the, what everybody has in the Nordics. Uh, and so by, by using that as a benefit, um, we, we see that that trigger interest when, uh, and maybe loyalty as well, uh, when you first have a good candidate on the hook. Yeah, but I mean, coming as a, uh, somebody who's born and raised in, in, in a Nordic company, other country, and then moving to the US, you have a, um, a I mean, I, I perceive uh, label labor laws and regulations in, in the U.S. a bit uh, slightly not as um, strong as in back home. I mean, you have uh, step up or ship out and you have uh, hire and fire uh, in the U.S. Is that something that's normally used or is it just uh, something that we, that, we, <laughs> that we think that it works like that here? Uh, so... For sure, it's it's leveraged as, as much as they can. Uh, people have to go go, uh, you know, on the same day and all of and can go on the same day and mm -hmm. and this is obviously um, a disadvantage to employees, uh, but it's also uh, but it's an advantage for the dynamic of the labor market. Um, so when a Nordic company who who typically where it typically takes you know three to six months to both identify and secure a good candidate uh, before they can start work then um, then here it's basically the next day so that adds to the dynamics but uh, obviously a disadvantage to employees uh, on on the other hand i would say that california is actually quite strict when it comes to uh, labor laws and it's not so far from, from the Nordics as uh, we like to think, but this varies from state to state. Would you want to weigh in there, Sean? Or... Yeah, yeah, it's something I'm like really, really torn on. And um, yeah, these, these three months, because I'm like half greedy capitalist and now I'm like half Nordic values. <laughs> and like, if someone is not performing in their job, like my thought is like, get them out as fast as possible. Don't waste my money, my payroll money. Don't, don't drag others down. <laughs> so it's yeah. like, I'm really torn on it. And I've been both sides. I've, I've been an employee in Norway and it's like, man, you feel so good. You just like, you have so much security knowing that, that even if worst case scenario, you have time to, to make your next step as well. So I, I don't know. I'm, I'm really torn on it, to be honest. I, I think it's bad for business, but I think it's amazing for just building this quality and, and reducing the stress of your employees. 
you know, Americans, they talk about this, but this like living paycheck to paycheck is so common. Uh, and so it's like taking that away from them is awesome. I, but I don't know, maybe I think we're going to get to this topic at something, but it's like, I think the bigger advantage is bringing the Americans to the Nordics, which I think is now easier to do because of the current situation. And I, I, we have experience. We had an experience with this at Whereby where we brought an American salesperson because we wanted the American sales style. I don't think he even cared what we paid him or what the job was. He just wanted to come for the quality of life. That was his whole thing. He was stressed out. He had lived in a city his whole time. He had been bouncing around jobs because he was a salesperson. So you're in and out. So it was like, I don't know. It's like the opportunity, I think, is the other direction of, you know, to bring them here and sell these benefits, the maternity, paternity leave for young families. Like this is your like magnet to attract talent away uh, if you're not ready to make the leap and, and set up office in America. That's an excellent uh, point, Sean. And, and um, we do see that the interest that way uh, is, uh, is certainly increasing. Uh, and particularly with, particularly with the positioning that the Nordics is uh, now taking when it comes to being a more sustainable market and, uh, and with more sustainable, let's say, uh, ethics, uh, yeah. business ethics, um, than, uh, than certainly in this market. So um, I think that's a great opportunity because we particularly the tech industry uh, in the Nordics need more people. And uh, so this is a great opportunity for foreign direct investment. Yeah, I really like that idea of bringing uh, specialists from the US to home to the Nordics instead. Uh, that's a good twist. But I mean, we can't have a seminar based out of Silicon Valley without talking about venture capital. We need to mention that we have Sand Hill, Sand Hill Road, which is like equivalent to Wall Street for the, uh, the stock markets. But everything is bigger in the US. We've talked a little bit about that and I guess even ticket size. So does that mean that the Swedish companies looking for investments in the US needs to be bigger than back home when they're raising the same type of like series? Would you no, maybe, was... Sean, would you? Yeah, it, it actually was a big part of my thesis of, of why we tried to expand 500 startups there. Because as I looked at it, my view was like, these companies are as good as Silicon Valley companies. And we touched on that a little bit, the engineering, the quality of product, like there is no difference, but the valuation of the companies was half the valuation of Silicon Valley. So that was my thought of like, wow, if I can help bring these Nordic companies to Silicon Valley as an investor, my valuation immediately goes up. So I've immediately increased my portfolio valuation just by bringing them there and, and getting them to sort of raise capital there. But of course, like, yeah, that, that's a, a big, big challenge. Uh, I've talked about some of the things in terms of like the US investors want to see some US revenue. Mm -hmm. um, there's some legal requirements, you know, you, you really have to be a Delaware company. And this is a very American reason because a Delaware company pays the least amount of tax when the company sells. <laughs> so another like nuance, Americans, we pay, don't want to pay tax. <laughs> uh, you know, Scandinavians, very happy to because you get so much for the money. Totally get that. So you, you have to set up that Delaware corporation. So it, you have to be ready to do it. Um, but I think like that was really great when working with Nordic Innovation House and bringing so many companies there when we could because now they could have those meetings really quick. And before you did have to do in person, um, you mentioned Sand Hill Road and, and we have something called the Sand Hill Road Shuffle. And I've done it myself fundraising. You go door to door, you line up 10 meetings and you go door to door and you meet everyone in one day. So it's a, a super efficient, very tiring process, but you know, look at how fast, imagine if you did that for a week and now you've met 50 of the best investors in the area, you know, one week. So it's, it's there, but, is that necessary now? No, not really, because you can't. Everyone is taking pitches on, on video. So mm -hmm. I really actually hope that this view of like, you have to be in Silicon Valley to raise money. I, maybe this is one bright spot out of all this, you know, we're going through that this is changing and we're seeing it. We're seeing US venture funds put more money into both Norway and Sweden and even Finland and, and a little bit in Iceland as well. So it's, 
it's kind of changing. So I, I don't think you need to be there. You do need to know how to run maybe an American process and, and have the American aspirations of, of how big the business will be. But I'm, I'm actually hopeful you don't have to be there to kind of close that thought. Uh, yeah, because we were thinking about that as well. I mean, doing due to uh, the situation right now, like, do you really need to to move here? But I guess like building upon that thought that you had, you, you still need to maybe come over yes, to get the network, get the connections, but then um, or get the feeling for the culture. And then you maybe you could continue growing your company from your hometown or your home country. Uh, but at least then you have the feeling for it, what makes... Uh, no, what makes Silicon Valley Silicon Valley? Uh, yeah, that, that was also a really great thing about the Tink program when it happens there. And every founder kind of, you, they're like, wow, I can't believe how fast things happen here. <laughs> they just get super inspired. Um, but like right now, I mean, you can't. You're like literally cannot enter the country and, and we don't know when this is going to change. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I don't know. It's it's sort of a tough situation. Um It used to be though, the bigger challenge was like VCs want to be what they call value add in, in Silicon Valley. So they do more than the money. The money should be the least important piece. And they want to be able to say like, hey, I'm going to introduce you to Facebook today. Can you go drive over there? And that's really hard to drive from Stockholm to Menlo Park <laughs> in a short period of time. So like, That was the big reason why we're losing you, Sean. Yeah, poor Sean. I think it's is it a power outrage? Maybe it's starting to affect the doors and connect you right away and yeah. do that if you're eight thousand. But again, now that's all changed. And he was spending a lot of time there to build this. Oh. Can you hear us, Sean? We're cracking up a bit. Yeah. Did I come back? Yeah, you came back. But uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm on my 4G, so it's not going to be as reliable. But we have a question from the audience, right? Yeah, we have. We actually have two. Uh, Stanislav is... Uh, mm -hmm is really interested in uh, both the first things that you were discussing uh, regarding the culture. Do you really need to be that, you know, super aggressive person to succeed in, in the US? I would say maybe you answered that already in your discussion and your recommendation was like, hire one, hire one American or? Yeah, I think so. Let, let them do it for you. Um, I would say if you're in a market that has five other players, yeah, you absolutely have to be aggressive. If you are driving something a little more unique, then you can be a little bit more high touch or more sort of handholding in the way that you do it. But yeah, if, if you're dealing with five or 10 other players, you really have to be that aggressive because they will be if you're not. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. Uh, and based on my much fewer experience from the the culture, I I, I agree. And then um, it's really good to have a native person being that aggressive, because it's a little bit demanding for our Swedish culture. Yeah. Um, but another question here uh, that I think is um, very interesting uh, is: there really one best approach to raise uh, U.S. venture capital uh, while staying in Sweden uh, as a Swedish company? Or I. I think it's definitely more possible for a Swedish company than a Norwegian company, just because of VCs do a lot of pattern matching. And the pattern in Sweden is you can build really big companies and you can build the unicorns. So you have this like unicorn per capita number mm -hmm. that is second only to Silicon Valley. So yeah, you can, I think they will get over their local needs to have that opportunity. Uh, in Norway, we, we, we haven't proven ourselves enough that we can do that. But yeah, I think you can stay Swedish and stay a Swedish entity, it, especially if you're growing like crazy. They'll, they'll bend to you. Great. That, that feels good. Gru, do you have any yeah. comments on that one too? Yeah, so, so also uh, looping back to Sean's comments on, on the venture capital scene in general, I would say 
certainly COVID has brought uh, Silicon Valley and the Nordics closer together and the world as such. Mm -hmm. And we've said for a long time that as a software company, you don't necessarily have to be in Silicon Valley, but you need to know what's going on there. And, and that's kind of pointing back to this um, uh, fundraising uh, game. Uh, we often, or sometimes at least too often see and hear that Nordic companies say that we weren't able to raise funding back home because um, they don't understand what we're doing. And here in Silicon Valley, they, are, they have built big companies before, they are tech savvy and they, under, they will understand what we do. And uh, that's just not the case. And um, if, that, if that's kind of how you think, you need to reconsider because um, investments are about trust. And the investors and the earlier phase, the more it is about their trust or the trust between you and the investor, you as a person. And that takes time to build. And if you haven't been able to raise capital from the network that know you, then why should the network that does not know you put their money behind you? So uh, well, our recommendation, and the, particularly now when the, um, the early phase uh, capital system is, has matured so much in the Nordics, it is easier for a Nordic company to raise the fir first round or rounds in, back in the Nordics usually. And, and then I would say, uh, you, or you asked, is there a one way to raise capital? And I, I would tend to say yes in Silicon Valley because in the Nordics, the, the, uh, let's say the processes are so much less structured and there is no kind of informal rule as to when you can raise what type of capital while in Silicon Valley there is. And we're back to Sean's metrics and it is possible to sit back in the Nordics and fulfill those metrics and then show it to the Silicon Valley ecosystem. And we, we did actually see before even COVID that um, uh, the first really top tier um, Silicon Valley investors invested in a Norwegian company called Tibber, who's not now also active in Sweden without ever having met the company. And if you know where this company is based, it's based out of Førde, who is Ferde, like yeah. Ferde. It's like the tiniest rural place you can think of on the Norwegian West Coast. And they're really building uh, a very successful uh, tech startup uh, from there. And so um, I would say, um, yes, there is a there is a recipe, and uh, and that is based on metrics, but it's also based on your network. And I'm also uh, thinking we, we don't have that much. It's only two minutes left of the session. But uh, I'm also thinking. I mean, you are there also, Nordic Innovation House, and and I mean now you have Marcus with. That's uh, one of our stars and we miss him already here in Sweden and so on. So how can you help? Uh... Can, can I say something there? And that is, uh, you see behind both, uh, you saw behind Sean and behind Marcus and myself, we promote our Bifrost Talks. And if you go to our website, nordicinnovationhouse.com, Bifrost Talks, you will see um, uh, webinars, recorded web webinars, about how to raise funding in both the Nordics and in Silicon Valley. It's with a former um, colleague of us who uh, is also a partner in Alliance Venture, Alna Tonning, and he goes through this very structured. So I can re recommend the talks that he has. Great. My power just came back on, of course, right at the end. <laughs> so I, at least I can say goodbye and you can see me. <laughs> yeah, but was there any more questions or, or I'm happy to stay on for a minute or I two think, more? Uh, Daniel had a question, but he had to leave, unfortunately. Uh, okay. So uh, what he would like to know is, uh, I mean, this is recorded, so it will be possible for all the startups actually getting meetings with American large companies during you know, the Sweden Innovation Days to see it and beyond. So it could be worth uh, if you know what companies you really, really, really want to get in contact with, uh, but you don't have a good entry point, what's the best strategy? 
And now, like, I know Daniel, um, and he's a hunter. So you can just, you know, give him a hunter strategy. He will be happy for it. Yeah, it's probably different depending on maybe what industry or, or what you're trying to do. Um, it is a one difference is like in America, sometimes it's okay to go top and try and get pushed down, try and start higher, and then they will connect you to the right guy or girl from there. Uh, in the Nordics, you kind of want to be more precise and you don't want to go above someone's head. But America, it's okay. And they might take the meeting or they'll they'll sort of push you to the right place as well. And I think if we think, I know we're being a little stereotypical, but Americans do like to talk about themselves. So you go to them and you don't say things like, I want to pick your brain. That's something that American busy people don't like because it sounds kind of weird. But, but you want to, and it sounds like you're trying to steal information from them. So you actually approach and say, I would love to understand how you do this, or I saw you did this, and I would love to know how that worked. How did you do that? Make them talk about their success, talk about the good things they have. You know, they'll be more likely to want to wanna share and do their kind of bragging thing as well. And then they are good conversationalists, so they'll just kind of switch it back to you and say, oh, and what are you doing? What are you working on? And now you have your opportunity without having to sell it all, they'll open the door for you and, and allow you to talk about what you're doing as well. And then you can tie that into trying to generate some value, trying to get in, trying to get a test, whatever it might be. So yeah, get them bragging and they'll naturally ask you about what you do and they'll try and look for some ways to connect from there. So it, it does work this way. Okay. Great, thank you. I know we're running on overtime, but I just have one last question to the both of you that I would like you to uh, to answer if you can. And that's, uh, do you have like a final tip or a recommendation to companies trying to enter the US market with like do's or don'ts? Like it could be something within your uh, specific area of expertise or just the top of mind, but like something to send them on with uh, on the way. Hmm, good one. Gro, do you want to start? Yes. Um... Stay with your passion and, and don't kind of try to change who you are or what you do, but uh, be good at promoting what you're unique at and why it's your passion. Yeah, I mean, that's great. Yeah, I really like that. I think I maybe would build on that too, where don't be seduced by the sort of glam of Silicon Valley or LA if you're going there. Yeah, go there, put in the work, you know, you're going to have to grind and fight. And, and that's just kind of how it is there too. But you can go there and be successful, just putting your head down, getting the meetings, getting your customers. That's what I would actually do. I wouldn't get too trapped up in the sort of all the events when we used to have events, <laughs> all of this kind of stuff. Like I, I would be more about, no, I'm going there. I have very specific goals. I'm getting this B2B customer. I'm getting a thousand customers in America. And I would just be really, really focused on that and then be sort of selective where you spend your time because that is one disadvantage. It's easy to get distracted there. There's so much going on. It might be a little more boring back here in the Nordics, but that's good. <laughs> Why do you think they build so many great gaming companies in Finland? There's nothing else to do but play games. <laughs> <laughs> so they just have their head down on it too. So, you know, learn from it, adapt it. And then I guess I'll close the thought of like the American way is not the best way. The Nordic way is not the best way something in between the middle. So just find that like middle balance, you'll do just fine for that. Great. So thank you very much to both of you for taking time. Uh, and thank you, uh, Ignite, for hosting this. Um, thank you. Yeah, so thank you I guess, very, uh, very much. Super interesting session. I'll give it back to you, uh, Sina, for any closing remarks. Thank you. I really don't have any. Uh, I really want to say thank you very much. And I'm um, looking forward. We are going to reconnect again uh, in a couple of weeks. On the, I'm sorry, my husband is cooking. And that might be the sound you hear. <laughs> no I'm going to have dinner soon. Yeah. Uh, so uh, um, we are going to reconnect again. And uh, in just a couple of weeks. Uh, during the discovery sessions. During the Ignite Sweden Day. Uh, so anyone... Uh, eager to, to understand more of uh, Nordic Innovation House and get in contact, uh, you're welcome to join there as well. It's uh, Sweden Innovation Days. Uh, so, and we already have like 2,800 on the list. So that feels great. Looking forward. Fantastic. Yeah, Thank you so much. 
Thank you for having yeah. me. Thanks for having me. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.